Uh, more of this. And say good afternoon, good morning for those of us here on the West Coast, West Coast in the sunny time, and hopefully everybody's having a great, uh, great weather uh, across the country. So it's Randy Levante here uh, for Candy Learn, uh, and happy to have Keith Harrison here teaching at Palos of Beyond Borders, a uh, new school at uh, Allison Handhouse, did an orientation for us last month to the teacher preparation and training course, and to this. Uh, today we have Keith Harrison join, joining us to provide an overview to the GO course, which is their online introduction course for students. So without further ado, Keith, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Randy. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Keith Harrison. I'm a teacher here at Palliser Beyond Borders in Coldale, just outside of Lethbridge. Um, and I am going to be presenting on our introductory course, how we develop it, where we're going with it, and a walk through of the course. So I'm excited to be here and to see everyone in and I hope that um, everyone can find something here. Um, I'm going to go through this. Feel free to stop me to ask questions, comment, use the chat, talk, whatever you want to do. Um, and hopefully uh, we can get a good conversation, discussion going and go from there. So without further ado, here we go. So. Um, this is on the Go course, the Getting Online course, uh, but I'm going to start with how we got there. So our process um, began actually before I joined Palliser Beyond Borders um, with how to introduce students to online learning. Um, and there are a lot of different options there. I'm sure everyone here is familiar with a lot of them. Um, Right, the start is where do you need to know, um, where do you need to fit, what do you need to teach. So Piles are Beyond Borders on the scale is fully automated, asynchronous, continuous enrollment, uh, online course. So we have kids popping in at any point of the year, they start their courses, and so we wanted to be able to get them up to speed in online learning. Um, one of the big things, obviously, with an introductory course or getting students in is how are they learning how to interact with your course, right? Not just English or math or science, but how are they learning the online uh, part of it? And so what we looked at was a few different options of what we could do. So we looked at what are the goals, what do we want to achieve? Um, how are we going to achieve them and how will it benefit the learning? Um, I'm a big fan of uh, Vygotsky and the zone of proximal development and um, we definitely use that in the development in what can they already do, what do they know about the internet and learning online, accessing, navigating and what is the steps that we expect them to learn and what is out of their reach and identifying what is in that zone of proximal development and what is outside of it, what is the failed development. Um, and we found our kids were all over the place. Some kids pop in and they instinctively navigate and, and they rip through everything, they find exactly where they need to go, assignments, drop boxes, communication, they're discovering stuff we didn't know about and we have other students who are not sure how to open a module. So uh, we needed to develop a course that fit everyone. Um, part of it is we're worried about time. Um, how long do we want kids spending in a course when they could be spending it in you know, social or English? How much time should they spend in this introductory course? But we found it's front loading. Um, and students invest the time and later on it becomes significantly easier. Um, as they build skills, then they're able to add and grow and develop. And it needed to be a, uh, a start, it needed to be proactive, it couldn't be a response. Um, it couldn't be, oh, kids are, are having trouble here, I'll go in and show them. Frustration levels at that point, difficulty we're building. And so it really became about, we thought this was going to be a valuable use of their time. And that was a big decision. A lot of the problems with introductory courses is people don't want students spending too much time in them. 
Uh, we use the the SAMR model. Um, I think everyone may be familiar with this. For those that don't, it's just how you're using technology. Um, at the beginning, a lot of our courses were at the substitution level. They were print courses that you could access on your computer. And so the introductory course initially was simply geared at how to access the courses and not how to actually do interactive engaging things with them. So we looked at our options. So the first option and something that we found is quite common um, yeah, sorry about that. That was, we were having difficulties loading the, the slides. So hopefully everyone can see. Um, and that's why I'm doing a bit more of reading the slides than I normally would just to make sure if we're having trouble viewing them. Um, so first option and a really common one, teachers are responsible for introducing kids in their own courses. Often you'll see a module or a pre-module or a pre-unit on how to learn the course. Um, there's some advantages there. You can tailor it for how your course works. Um, and it doesn't have to be outside of it. You're not maintaining other courses. You're not running other courses. It's just a part of yours. A problem is you're now adding sections and time to your courses. And students are just learning how to access your course. They're not learning how to access mine. They're not learning how to access the schools. Um, so you need to have one of these in every single class. Um, and it's not credit and it can't be part of your formal assessment. It's not part of the outcomes for English or for math. And so um, there is the question of what's the value. Exactly. Changes and variations done by teachers may start to confuse students. Exactly. Um, Right, and so you think you know how it works, but then you jump into another course and they're running in a different way um, with completely different styles and objectives. Um, a non credit introductory course is a very similar idea. You just pull the, the intro units out of the individual courses and put them as one. But since it's non-credit, it's just a, a quick explainer. Um, and then you're you're running into some trouble. Um, you have an extra course to maintain now, and there's not a payoff for the students. And that's a big deal. Yeah, the template's something that we did. Yeah, can teachers get on the same page to a degree? And I'll show you how we dealt with that. Um, Option three is the one that Palliser Beyond Borders chose to go with at the beginning. A one credit introductory course. They earn a credit, it's curriculum based, and you need to build the school from similar components, but every student takes it, and so you understand where that student is at. Um, and so that's what Palliser Beyond Borders did, and it created, um, if I can just find the slide. Com 1255. So sorry for the tiny image here. It's just showing a very basic course layout with um, three elements that we've coined part of our palliserization. That, uh, that's the, what the word Allison likes to use. It's a one credit course for communication technology 1255 um, that we had all students taking. So when they signed up, they took this simple one credit course that showed them stuff like how to hand in an assignment and how to participate in a discussion board. Um, and it was effective. We ran it for seven, eight months. Um, however, quickly, and sorry you can't see these slides, these are just the actual parts that are in it. And so you can see this is the whole course, what I'm showing you. There's not a lot there. Um, we then decided to take a look at it. Um, 
Michael Willems and I were the ones who developed the Go course, were put in charge of COM 1255 for a while, and we realized looking at our students, talking to other teachers, it wasn't achieving what we wanted it to. We had over 200 students go through it, and then we saw those students interacting in their courses. Um, and so Michael and I decided to do a redesign. Essentially, we had too much stuff and we weren't giving enough kids credit for it. Every time we came up with an idea, someone would go, oh, that's great. Put it in 1255. Let's put in a page on how to access quizzes. Let's put in a page on how students are going to respond to um, discussion boards that are based on replies only compared to new topics. So what we then decided to do, this is our new course and you can see it's a little, it's getting a little bigger, a little more interesting. Um, we decided to skip ahead and build a new course. And we decided to build the Getting Online course as a three credit course. In order to build a three credit course, it needed to contain five modules, one of which, or and one of the credits is a project. So COM 1255 and COM 1005 are each individual courses, and COM 1910 is a project course based on the first two. So it teaches students how to use the tools and features in courses, how to navigate Palace or Beyond Borders, Sorry, just reading some comments here. Um, so we're confusing you, Keith. Uh, this is just a side conversation. We'll bring it back in after you've gone through the, the session here. So, sorry okay, about that. not a problem. Um, I was just going, hang on, I'm not sure if this is, but it's all good. Um, and then we teach different things such as plagiarism and netiquette and cyberbullying and features of online courses that we felt are really necessary. Um, and like I so said, we called it the Go course. Um, so it contains all sorts of things, draw boxes, quizzes, rubrics, discussion boards, all sorts of different Moodle tools and used in a lot of different ways. But it also includes things such as a reading and writing assessment. Um, our board uses um, Fontes and Pinnell and the uh, Ontario, uh, the OCA, um, and so we built a literacy assessment that students take in this. All kids who go through, all students who go through our courses take this literacy assessment and we use that as a tool to um, guide our intervention, to guide our assessment of, of students and putting supports in place. And then students create a final project using a web 2.0 tool so they learn the tool as well as providing the content. these kids put in so much time and learn all these different things. But all of these things are then, you can know when you have this student in your course, they have completed Go, they have successfully used all of these tools. The value there is huge. When you're designing your courses, you don't have to use all of these, but you know that if you are using Google Docs, your students have used them and used them successfully. They have used Prezi, they have done quizzes, they have done a project using 2.0 uh, tools. So there are some major advantages to doing it this way when you do your course design. The Go course, currently active. 300 plus students have completed that course. That is actually, that number's obsolete. I didn't change it, we're up to um, 400. Our completion percentage climbed massively once we introduced Go. Um, what we're able to do is have the design of your courses reflect Go and have Go reflect the design of your courses so that students are able to achieve success in the technology with what you're doing. Um, we have four sites, we have four outreach sites, so four campuses, um, Pass Plus and Coaldale, Picture Butte Outreach and Picture Butte, Vulcan Outreach and Vulcan and Palliser Alternate School in Calgary. Um, 
every single site has a teacher on site who has either taught Go, team taught it with me, or has been trained in it so that students are always having someone there who can help guide them through it and can start building relationships before they even get in your English course. They know you from Go. This has also been a huge part of it, the building relationships through this intro course. So what do you want your introductory course to do is a question that often gets um, off-site so, or that doesn't get involved um, because you start building with great ideas and then you realize you may have added something that your teachers aren't using anymore and isn't necessary or you're adding a really cool tool that no one's using. And so keeping in mind the goal of for us, we want it so that students are learning the technology. Um, John, for your question, how do you handle new Web 2.0 tools that are added? Well, that's done because if you are looking at a specific item, let's say a specific tool, we suggest that you teach that tool unless um, you know it's one that's been covered in the course. However, what teachers often do is to give students a lot of choice, say, you need to design this project with a Web 2.0 tool, but they don't specify which one because students in the Go course are only going to use one and some students use two Web 2.0 tools, but you know as the teacher that they know how to use a Web 2.0 tool. So I can say you create a project for English, you're going to build a presentation on Macbeth, but you can do a Prezi or a screencast or an Animoto or a, a Weebly or a blog or whatever you want to do, whatever you've had success with, Exactly, a menu of technologies. Whatever you have success with, you can then use that in my class. And so my rubric is then designed to take that into account. Um, so here's just the, the quick context. Michael and I developed it. Michael is teaching at R.I. Baker, um, but he is still involved. We did some presentations there. If they use the tool not on list or teachers from Earth do the period, yes. So we have a discussion board where students post their final project as and what they thought of it and they fill out a survey on how easy it was to work with, how much they liked it, how it went. And so it gives students guidance. Um, I'd never heard of Weebly until some students said, can I create a website? And it was fantastic. I loved it. Um, and I'm at the point now where I'm really sick and tired of Prezi's. So um, I've upped the bar and expectations from them and I may simply remove them altogether because, yeah, exactly, you get vertigo watching too many of these Prezi's and some kids got it going corkscrewing upside down in there. So um, it allows for a lot of freedom. Um, so if you guys are ready to go, I can, uh, application share and show you the uh, the Go course. I uh, will just do a quick go through of some of the different elements and what we're doing. And just while Keith's setting up, <clears throat> just let people know once uh, the uh, the application sharing window shows up, at the top you have scale to fit request cursor control and stop sharing, or, well I do, sorry. <laughs> um, but scale to fit, it, it, it's automatically checked. If you uncheck it, then you'll end up with scroll bars that you can move around and make it the view and vision bigger as well. You can also adjust your window, uh, pull it out and adjust the size of that window as well. Uh, so there you go. Great. Thanks. So um, everyone's good to go. People can see that we're looking at the welcome to go. Maybe kind of, yes, green tick, if you can see it. Awesome, perfect. So, okay, just wanted to make sure. Um, so as you can see, just from first look, this is really busy. It's designed that way because some people have really busy courses. And so um, while at first we thought running it kind of blank might be the way to go, instead we went with we're going to run it busy, but we're going to explain all the elements. 
and we're going to show kids the busiest course we can so when they get into their courses, a busy course isn't a problem. Um, our policerization is this start menu. This start menu is in every course. Each of the boxes are linked to the individual thing. So we still have walkthroughs. Um, so in each course you have this. So in my English courses, when I could course outline, it goes to my um, English outcomes. But at this point, we're showing them the very basics of how to go through this. If you click on start here, it starts with the lesson of what they need to go through. Um, we have timelines throughout and we reference them frequently. Um, lots of things, how to use Chrome, things like this. But the whole point of this is to guide kids through the exact same way they'll access their course. Um, sorry if there's some background noise, the school across the hall just got out. Um, we try and use the same tools we teach the kids to use. So we know that um, Jing is free, it records five minutes of videos, it's easy to use, kids like it, and so that's what we use. Um, we were both more familiar with some other tools, but this is the one that we got the best feedback from students, so that's how we built our course. Um, we added the, the discussion forums, lots of links, lots of all things that try and make it as easy to navigate as possible. Um, I'm just going to go through one more here for the glossary. Here's an example of how we've included tools throughout. For example, this glossary is an amazing free tool that some of us were incorporating into our courses and so we then reverse engineered it. We went back and altered Go to include this tool. Um, and that's a big part of how Go works is that Go informs the classes, the teachers, and then teachers inform Go so that they're always developing somewhat on par with each other. Um, on the left hand side, Blackboard Collaborate, Work Plan, Weekly Check-In, again this is a link, a box that's in every course. The Study Hall link, uh, we work late Tuesday nights in, uh, in one of the outreaches and we run a Tuesday night study hall. So any student can log in after school all the way to 7 p.m. and get help in any subject. We make sure we have teachers covering every subject available. And so that link is in every course. Um, the teacher box, the progress bar, the Twitter feed, all of these things are part of the policerization. Um, the course is broken up, like I said, into five modules. The first one leans heavily on teaching students how to use the tools. The first assignment, the screenshot of progress bar, uh, students have to take a screenshot of the progress bar so we know how do they use screenshots, they know what the progress bar is. They have to share it in a Google Doc with their teacher as well as submitting the shareable link. So it's an intensive course and you need to be able to do these five things. Um, the lessons run through how to create a Google Doc, what are the blocks, what is the screenshot, what are the badges, MyPass, Blackboard, like it's very direct and this is what we expect. So that when you have a student, you know they know all these things and if a student's having struggles, you can say, send me a screenshot and everyone knows they've successfully know how to take a screenshot and how to send it to you. Um, we also look at in building an online community, getting to know your teachers. So every teacher has submitted a web 2.0 tool introduction of themselves. So we've used the tools we expect the kids to use and they have submitted it so that everyone can see what their options are. Kids can see them in use. Um, some are simple videos, some are cartoons, some are, they're fantastic. So lots of great stuff. We use them to identify expertise. It's an area with badges that we're still working on, um, but we're starting to give them for kids who are able to complete different things, just to confirm they can do it. Um, 
there is an element of gamification. There's some stuff um, as students often refer to them. I can earn achievements, and they get all excited. And I have to explain that this is exactly like Call of Duty. Yes, you can earn achievements. You should spend as much time on this as you do Call of Duty. Um, but one of the key features that everyone gets is Call of Moodle. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, what people get excited about, we teach plagiarism. So that if you have a student in your course who plagiarizes, you know that they have been taught what plagiarism is, how to prevent it, and what the consequences are. So that you don't have to worry that maybe they haven't been shown it, maybe this was an innocent mistake. You understand and you can act as you feel appropriate. Um, we include a quiz, a great online quiz on how to determine plagiarism. After five years of university, I scored an 8 out of 10. There was two times I didn't know it was plagiarism and it totally was. It's a fascinating little quiz. Um, but we do lots of stuff to ensure that kids know about plagiarism and intellectual property, copyright, creative commons. So all this stuff is covered just so we know that students have it. In module two, the digital literacy, they learn about learning online. They take a quiz about learning online. Um, but then here's the digital literacy quiz. The digital literacy quiz, students read an article on their digital footprint. Then they start a quiz on it. The quiz is not collected by Moodle. The quiz is collected as a Google form so that I receive it because it is an assessment for literacy. If I scroll up here. You can see where we uh, have taken this and we use it in our evaluation. So these students all were flagged as, as yellow, um, a concern. If we head up to the top, we'll find um, red students who are um, not meeting expectations. And this is set at a grade 8 level, so a grade 10 student should be exceeding expectations. And our green students who have successfully completed this. And so this is turning into a larger and larger part of our course. Um, because now we know when kids are coming in, where they are, what we can expect. Um, the advantages there are, are huge. Um, we look at the ergonomics part. That's part of the, the curriculum. Um, kids really love learning about how to put a pillow on your lap if you're using a laptop. Um, but then they create a project plan. And the project plan, once successfully completed, gives them access to module five. And so we're showing kids, one, about creating the plans and everything, but also about how in some courses you need to complete some tasks, fulfill conditions before you have access to others. So little design features like that that we make sure they're in Go because they're not in every course, but then a student isn't going, well, I can't access this. Well, have you filled the con conditions like in Go? Um, lesson with questions, a quiz. Here's a really fun part of the course. I'm quite proud of this. Module 4 quiz, it says clearly right here, the quiz is password protected. You can find the password by reading through the Module 4 lesson. Anyone want to guess how many emails I get every week from kids who say they don't know what the password is and I haven't given it to them? It's one of my favorite things. So it's a great way to to reinforce the students. Did you read the instructions? Did you read the lesson? Did you go through everything or did you just jump through the hoop? Lots of kids, right, they just look for assessments. Not reading the lessons, not reading the questions, just looking for assessments. What do I got to do to get that check mark to complete the course? So um, little design features like this, I'm sure you do. Um, so little design features like that that are clearly explained because it's not a trick. I'm not trying to trick the students. I'm giving them every opportunity, and I still get it. And then the final project, student exemplars are included. Um, and we have some great ones. Like I said, this is a um, 
the project is on digital communications. This is where they're allowed to choose their Web 2.0 tool. So the student did a, a blog, and it's it's fantastic. I mean, videos, pictures, uh, images, everything is. If we get to the end here, cited and loaded, and it was just it was a great example of what giving students a rubric and their choice of tools and saying go for it. Um, and a go animate video. And then um, a Weebly student created a great website. Um, what they did, which I thought was fantastic, is they actually linked their sources, um, which I thought was so fantastic. If you're going to include it, include your sources. Allow me to access them right away. Um, lots of great information, lots of graphics. This is free. This was easy. He had a blast doing it, and it looks amazing. Um, he did one for me in social that is even better than this, and I was just so impressed. So um, we're able to show kids this is some of the awesome stuff that is, you're capable of doing. And if I can just show you guys the rubric, um, the rubric is designed for students to go above and beyond. Right, 100% isn't the top. 100% is where you can be. Um, and so, you know, some of the stuff is simple. Plan is approved. You have three sources, but some of it allows students to go, you know, so far above and beyond. Well, in depth with details and examples. The fact that he included all his sources as links, entries was fantastic. Um, elements of design and typography. For some kids, that means that the PowerPoints can have a red background, which is fine. And for other kids, it means they design each and every slide or page or link. Um, and then, you know, spelling and grammar is an important part. You are trying to show something off. But it also allows students to target where they're going to learn. And then when they get into their courses, they're familiar with this. So while it's a generic rubric, it allows teachers to build off this and kids know how to move through a rubric which is something a lot of students don't know how to do, especially in an online atmosphere. Right? A lot of students are used to asking a teacher, showing the teacher in their class, okay, you know, what do you think? Where am I at? What can I add? Um, and so by demonstrating the rubric, we're able to, you know, okay, look at the rubric. Where do you think you are? Let's talk about it. But in the uh, online atmosphere. So um, that's the Go course. Students are not allowed to pass the Go course until they've passed all the features. So if you fail the quiz, you have to do it again if the project's not up to snuff. Because obviously we can't pass you through the intro course if you haven't passed it. There's no point sending you to English or math if you haven't completed that element of the course. Um, our students tend to do it on average in 12 hours, 12 hours of work. Now. 12 hours of work. Um, sorry, if you're getting the uh, uh, random screen, you just have to click on the top um, to the whiteboard and you'll come back instead of seeing that spinning ball. Um, but the, uh, the 12 hours thing, we find some kids will do that in a weekend and some kids it takes months. But it's rare that a kid can do it faster than that. And it's rare that it takes a kid significantly longer than that. So while we do have those students that don't complete it, and we get a parent in very upset saying, you know, it's taken, uh, you know, I thought this was supposed to be quick. My student's been in this course, or my son's been in this course for two months, and they're still not done. We're able to, using Moodle tools, identify, well, your, your son has spent four hours in the course in those three months, and of course you can't complete it. So um, those expectations are really guiding how we complete the course. Um, obviously, the course changes on a regular basis, um, but it changes in a way where staff informs the course, the course informs other courses. So that's the presentation. Um, so if you guys have any questions, comments, you want to have a discussion about anything, let me know. Well, that's great. Thank you, Keith. I appreciate that. Yeah, there was uh, a number of different things, and I wouldn't mind getting into how many mics do we have open? If people have headsets, can we do multiple mics, Keith? 
Uh, yeah, it should be on multiple mics. Okay, so I just gonna I forgot I was uh, yeah we got up to six so um, chime in and Don I'm interested in and we had a little exchange sorry for confusing you Keith but um, one of the things about preparing besides having teaching students how to use the technology in and of itself um, the consistencies in structure around the course course design and layout. Um, not so much standardization, so you use the term palisarize, which is kind of like plagiarize or pasteurize or no, anyway, um, <laughs> that there's that consistency. So do teachers in your and Fellowship Beyond Borders use a typical Moodle template? I made a mention that that's, uh, I'm teaching a course at Royal Road University and they gave me a Moodle template as a course area and I'm probably going to use that template because they created it and the students are familiar with it. So have you done the same thing? Yes, exactly. And that's one of the, the strengths of this is when you build that template and then put it in the introductory course, when the student moves on, they're familiar with it. So our template is to use the, um, the start here menu, um, the teacher block, the um, special links block and so those templates. Now you can play around with where they want to sit in your course, things like that, but those are the main blocks. And then at the moment we're working to do simple things such as color coding. Um, those things visually really help students. So it doesn't have to be anything extreme, but it can really help students when they access the course. It looks just like the intro course they just passed. They're ready to tackle it because they can focus on the learning. Okay, great. I see Don, you're, you're texting. If you want to grab the mic, if you have one, uh, feel free to do the so or just text this line. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, and I really enjoyed this. This is uh, quite cool. Um, and it uh, certainly gets people past the idea that the Moodle is so tough. Um, I have a question, which is um, students, the idea of students as teachers and whether uh, there's an opportunity for students to make, say, a tutorial about like a, a new Web 2.0 tool they've learned, and whether that's something they could, uh, um, you know, uh, be part of the course, part of delivery. Yeah, that very much could. Um, at the moment, it's just a discussion board, but um, that's a great idea, and that's actually something I'm going to write down because I want to explore that more. Um, yeah, because we've been looking at ways to get students to take more ownership of it, and that sounds fantastic. Okay, yeah, I was thinking that Jane could, could work for that, right? So, yeah. Exactly, yeah. And I think Jin, or Jing and Weebly are two uh, fantastic examples of where students came to us, students were familiar with stuff and we were able to incorporate it. Um, just because if students are already using a tool, I mean, it can become uh, so powerful. I would be interested, uh, for, for me, Jing, because of being free um, to use is, is important. Um, to screen recording as well. Screencastomatic.com is another one that is, is free and is okay, doesn't really let you do a lot of editing. But I'm curious around the use of video and some tools, whether or not schools have made an investment in, say, a screen recording software or video recording software uh, at all. So I'm wondering, Don, in your travels, whether you have, Margaret, whether you use it, or Todd, in some of the consortium schools, whether you've seen use of any sort of video recording tool. Um, Sorry that I was muffled before. I've got the mic right in front of my face now, so hopefully I'm a little more audible. Um, yeah, I mostly teach adults, and um, I'm, I'll, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I mostly teach adults, and I teach them how to make portfolios for themselves. And one of the things I do is I, you know, teach them some tools so where they can do their own me in a minute type videos and things like that. Um, and what I had was Jing was one, and then Articulate had one for a while, but it seems to have gone gone away. I've looked at Screencast-O-Matic. I don't know of any open source ones or or ones where you can, um, yeah, whether whether or not there are tools out there. Maybe I should just shut up and maybe somebody else knows. 
uh, Chrome has Screencastify, which is a free add-on. It downloads those immediately to your own channel in YouTube. So if you're used to working in YouTube, that one is fantastic, but it is a Chrome extension. And then your videos are posted on YouTube. Yes, but it doesn't let you edit to the same degree as a screencasting software would, correct? Correct. But uh, I know a lot of people like it just for the YouTube function. And that YouTube allows you to edit videos. I think not to the degree, but to a functional level. Yeah, it, and, and there's a lot of those uh, plugins that are optional in a browser that will do that. And yes, that one in Chrome is, is excellent. Don? I was I was just going to say it's it's actually a skill to teach people and to tell them you know teach them about rehearsals etc. Um, is you know the fact that it can't be edited. Okay, so imagine you're doing this in front of a class. Uh, can you do it right and you know practice it a few times and do it and when is it good enough uh, without editing? You know it, it's it's interesting how you can use limitations sometimes as uh, teaching points. Absolutely. It's also horrifying to tape yourself teaching, but a wonderful teaching tool. And I show my kids that and then I say to them, create your video, watch it, and then see how well, what you could do to improve. Go ahead, Todd. Sorry, Todd here. Um, we, uh, when I was the principal of vice of the principal of e-learning at a school library, we uh, we purchased licenses for both Captivate and Camtasia and found those both to be very effective. But any time that I did any training of teachers, you know, originally we would use YouTube and all of our e-teachers would have their own YouTube channel and then would embed their videos and whatnot into D2L. It was getting them past the, you know, the fear that it had to be perfect. So, you know, we would, uh, when I would bring them together for a training session, I would actually have them create an introductory video uh, of themselves right there and, and, and then post it into their learning space in, in D2L. And, you know, you have to get over, you know, kind of get beyond the fact that it does not have to be perfect. Um, now, for some of the others where they're using more of a flipped style approach to teaching, um, you know, something like Captivate and Page is much more handy and much more powerful once more than, uh, than, than Jing. Of course, Jing being limited to the five minutes, but uh, Jing being so simple to use is also extremely good for screen tasks. But we're starting, you know, a lot of course writing going on in Ontario right now. Um, but you can go to HTML5. There's a program out there called Bootstrap. It's uh, starting to be, it's starting to, uh, uh, some popularity with the industry again. I haven't had a chance to see it. Um, it does kind of uh, bring forward some very interactive functionality to your uh, your learning courses. And in Ontario, we we have uh, provincially a licensed uh, D2L desire to learn. So you know, one of the things with regard to the orientation, the province itself is creating orientation for 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 all of the boards, but they don't make it mandatory for the boards to use it. And so it's, uh, it was very tool-based. It was good, but it was tool-based. And so what we did was uh, in the consortium, which, which I'm at, um, so we have a consortium of the course, we, uh, a lot of the boards started to create their own orientation courses, having their own individual writing groups and whatnot for own purposes. And then we you know, decided, figured that everybody was kind of reinventing the wheel and we could share some, you know, common knowledge and you know, specific expertise and, and put together a writing group that's now currently working on uh, something very similar uh, to what Keith has shown us. And Keith, that's extremely impressive. Um, but it'll be, it'll be something that won't be mandatory in the Ontario Learning Consortium. It'll be something that will be adaptable uh, to you. Uh, by each one of the boards. But the neat thing about D2L is that it has uh, the ability to do the badge system, of course, um, which is something that will be built into the orientation. But the other thing that our, our teachers do is use the conditions, which means that students are unable to 
proceed to their actual court until they have completed the normalization because there's a release condition built on the uh, on the completion of that particular course. So it's fully automated, and that's kind of the uh, motivation for students to get through the orientation. Um, but rather than being tool focused, we're, we're kind of looking at it with a similar lens of you know allow the tools allow the Things like digital citizenship and some of the other things that Keith had talked about. Um, so, anyway, that's uh, enough for me for talking. <laughs> uh, thanks. Yeah, um, we do the similar thing. Um, students have to complete Go before they're allowed access into their other courses. Um, and then we actually stagger the release. So, students complete Go, they get access to one course prove success in that and then they can gain access to another. And yeah, we found a lot of people, the introductory courses are, it's reinventing the wheel if every time a student takes a course they're learning the same thing um, or building different ones. And so building a base one like this, it's designed to be flexible, uh, really solves a lot of those issues, it ticks a lot of boxes, um, but it has to be flexible. Uh, we've removed stuff that was really successful in Go because teachers have moved on from it, which is heartbreaking, but what you have to do. Um, and so it has to be a dynamic course. No, that's that's great. Good dialogue, and I appreciate the uh, the conversation back and forth. I don't know, Todd, whether is anyone using the D2L um, the portfolio module and component in Ontario that you know of, or are they starting to build students' portfolios outside? That's something that Don is is quite conversant with uh, PDF, uh, or sorry, the portfolio uh, opportunities and options. So I'm just curious whether D2L portfolio is being used. I know I avoided it in using the D2L in my work at Vancouver Island University. Made them build their own Weebly sites. Uh, you know, often people say e-portfolio is like driving a thumbtack with a sledgehammer because it, it, does, <laughs> it does have so much, uh, so much functionality. Um, you find that it's being dependent upon the board and then dependent upon the e-teacher, I guess, uh, you know, it kind of fluctuates, it varies around the province with regards to its usage. Also, ePortfolio is attaching itself to many other programs such as uh, co-op. We're starting to find that it's being uh, used more and more in cooperative education for, you know, even things like timesheets, reflective journals, um, the portfolio obviously itself, um, resumes and job applications, etc. There's also um, a relatively new directive or initiative from the ministry called the All About Me portfolio, which a lot of boards are now moving over into a digital uh, form of portfolio that follows the students as they uh, migrate their way through intermediate and then into secondary school. So um, I know that the previous board that I was with was uh, looking at uh, D2L and or specifically ePortfolio as being the um, as being the tool that they would use uh, for students in creating their All About Me portfolio because as you can understand with students, particularly uh, in the intermediate grades, if they're trying if they're going to try and do this uh, via hard copy, um, it's highly doubtful that those hard copy portfolios, no matter how well organized the process uh, is, they will not return the following year and be maintained the way that they should. So having it digital, uh, means that it will always be with you. The neat thing about the uh, province's agreement with our vendor D2L is that even after students graduate high school in Ontario, they will always have access to ePortfolio and its functionality. So yeah, that's it. That's cool. Yeah, that's a great way to do it. Randy, I'm just uh, picking up on your uh, question about Open Badge Factory. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's got you just fine. Okay, great. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I've, I guess uh, that will 
underlay my early question about badges. Certainly you can issue badges inside learning management systems. Moodle was the first to do it. And I'm very pleased to see that uh, D2L started doing it last year. Um, there can be issues with issuing badges if you're thinking about them beyond pure formative, you know, gamification, you know, great you did that, now try and do this and compete with your buddies, uh, you know, on, on the leaderboard, et cetera. You can get um, fragmentation of systems where if it's um, issuable and controllable at the course level, you can have what wouldn't be a, a strategic approach to uh, credentialing if it's credentialing you're after. If you're looking for more summative um, uh, value out of your e-credentials or open badges. And uh, that's kind of why open badges were invented. The idea that you can earn them here and then take them over there and you know present them on LinkedIn or in an e-portfolio regardless of where you earn them. So I'm working with um, uh, some folks in Quebec, for example, um, coming up with a Canadian version of this where you'd be able to issue badges from inside an LMS and using a plugin, um, you, uh, they actually get created on a central platform that can be managed easier there and you could then issue them in multiple LMSs or multiple platforms, could be WordPress, uh, could be manual and then they're managed in a, in a single place. So that's, I don't know if that answers your question there, Randy, or, um, or maybe just confuses the issue, <laughs> I'm not sure. No, I, I think it opens up the conversation, which is what I wanted to do. It's not part of this presentation, but certainly in orienting students to online, that's the entry point. Um, but then recognizing there's what they've done online and being able to share that in a broader audience is what Keith was starting to show in terms of the students' work as well. So I think it, we can't forget about that, uh, the end product of this as well. So. Um, what I do want to do, because looking at the time, I don't know that this room is used for other other events and things. Just wanted to say, right now, um, thank you to you, Keith, in terms of providing an overview. And I know that I'll be working with Allison uh, and yourself, Keith, hopefully as well, to pull together a spotlight, which uh, it will will feature some of the work that Palace of Beyond Borders is doing uh, as well, and then uh, aggregate that on the Candy Learn website so that others can have access to the materials. So we'll include this recording and, you know, I'll talk to you, Keith, a little bit about slides and things like that. Uh, but we're going to do one more as well coming up. So watch for it in May sometime. We're going to feature Navigate Knives, uh, which uh, won the um, INACL Award for Innovation uh, Innovative Program of the Year last year. So um, bring some of the members together. Uh, and Don, I'd love to do some uh, spotlight on the badging and what's happening as well for Candy Learn, just to get the word out for members. But at this point, I'm Keith, thank you for doing a great job. Really appreciate the overview. And I know that there'll be other questions that'll be coming around what, uh, you know, resources and sharing can happen afterwards. But we'll chat a little bit offline and we'll put that feature together with Allison. And uh, yeah, great. Any other closing comments from others? But because of the carbon. Yeah, that is great. Well, thank you all for coming and for those that watched the recording as well. Thanks. Appreciate that. I'm just going to kill the recording at this point in time. Uh, keep